So welcome, everyone. Uh, so this is, uh, we're going to try to keep it pretty upbeat. <laughs> Great. Uh, I just want to say something uh, personal to Steve uh, about this whole idea of palliative care medicine. So um, I play tennis at the San Francisco Tennis Club, and I play on Saturday mornings. It's at, like a challenge court. And there's a woman there who plays. And another woman said to me, um, what's with her? She's so grumpy. And, <laughs> and I, said, I said, she is a palliative care physician at Kaiser in Oakland, and she automatically gets a halo over her head. <laughs> and I don't care how she can be as grumpy as she wants. And this woman, the woman who was asking me this, actually pushed back and said, yeah, but she never wants to, like, she doesn't even remember my name. I said, she doesn't have to remember your name. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's automatically going to heaven. So, uh, so Steve, uh, thank you so much for doing what you do. Thanks. It is, uh, I just can't even begin to imagine how tough it is. So speaking of which, um, I'm going to start out by asking you, how it is that you came to enter the palliative care specialty, and how have you seen it evolve? Well, first, thank you for that. I'm glad I get straight into heaven. My mom said you, the way you get into heaven automatically is if you, um, if you make a, a couple and they get married, then you automatically get into heaven. My mom did that three times, so <laughs> she is Golden. in heaven three times. Um, so my interest in this uh, really evolved out of my interest in ethics. When I went to medical school uh, here at UCSF in 1985, there was no palliative care. I had never heard the word. Um, it wasn't in our so curriculum. What year, what year was that? 1985, when mm -hmm. I started here. And there was no palliative care. There was no palliative care service. There, it wasn't in the textbooks. We, did, we had no class. We had no lecture about it. Of course, we learned about all these diseases that make you very, very sick, uh, but we didn't learn anything about what to do about that when we didn't have cures. Um, but my interest was really in ethics. And it turns out, as I look back, the reason is because ethics was the place that people were talking about these issues. And they said, you know, there are these people who are in the ICU who don't want to be there, who are on mechanical ventilation, right? They're on breathing tubes and lots of machines, and they're not going to get better, and nobody's talking to them about what to do. And this is an ethical issue. It's an ethical crisis that we have to address by focusing on issues of autonomy. What do you really want? And talking to people in advance. And the challenge with ethics is that we, they call an ethics consult, and the, we, we, the ethics team would come, and we'd sit with the doctors and nurses, and we'd talk, and we'd say, what you need to do is find out what the patient really wants, and then do that. And then we'd walk away. And it was very unsatisfying to tell other people what to do. Uh, and then when I joined the faculty, I realized, wait a minute, there is this thing called palliative care. And in palliative care, what you get to do is you actually get to go talk to people and help them understand what's really important to them. And then you actually get to provide the care yourself, which is way more satisfying and more engaging. And that's, that's how I discovered it. And then when I was first on the faculty, I learned about this something called the Project on Death in America. That's a great name. Um, but it was a grant program by the Open Society Institute to try and promote better care for people who are seriously ill and at the end of life. And I, I was fortunate enough to get one of those grants. And that kind of launched my career in that direction. So did the, did the specialty already have a name, palliative care? So How by then it did. So it's interesting. You know, I, I was just reflecting on this. So I started medical school in 1985. The, the Medicare hospice benefit that established hospice in the United States was signed into law in 1982, only in 1982, by Ronald Reagan. So um, he's actually a hero in our field <laughs> in a very limited way. No, um, but nonetheless. Hey, in more ways uh, than one these days. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when I think back on it, that was only three years old. Now, there had been hospices since 1972, but only since 1972. The very first hospice was in Yale, in, in New Haven, Connecticut, in 1972. The second oldest hospice in America is Hospice by the Bay, right here in our Bay, own Bay Area, from the 70s. So it was a really new field. By then, it did have a name, but literally the first time I heard the name of the specialty was when I applied to this program. And was there like an inventor, like um, 
who coined the word. So Balfour Mount, who is an oncologist who practices in Canada, coined the term palliative care. Mm -hmm. and, and really, the, if, you're, if you're looking for sort of the inventor of modern palliative care, you'd have to turn to Cicely Saunders. Cicely mm -hmm. Saunders was a social worker and a nurse, and then went to medical school. Wow. Uh, so she was, a, we always say she's an entire palliative care team in one human being. Um, she was in England. She practiced at St. Christopher's Hospice. And she really invented the, the field and really described what our field is about, the care of seriously ill people and people at the end of life. So talk to us about what it was like to build the, cali the palliative care program here at UCSF. And what about the, some of these cultural kind of tensions? So it, uh, there was a group of us back in the 90s now who had experienced caring for people who are sick and people who are dying and realized there's got to be a better way. People are in our ICU. They're, they're not comfortable. The families don't know what's going on. Nobody's talking about things. And this was absolutely my experience uh, in training, that we didn't really talk about these things. and. Um, we were afraid to. We didn't. We didn't know what to do. Just the American culture of not wanting to. I mean, why? Because it was. Um, it was very negative. It was very bad. It was. A, it was a sign of failure on the part of the medical system that we couldn't cure people, even though everybody dies, as it turns out. Uh, but still, it was a sense of failure. Like we have failed the patient, and we're not going to talk about it. I remember so clearly a woman I took care of on our bone marrow transplant unit. So I was an intern. She was 22 years old, and she had a two-year-old daughter. And she had very advanced leukemia. And she'd been through many treatments, bone marrow transplant. And she just, she was not getting better. And she got to the point where her bone marrow had been destroyed by the cancer and the treatment. And so she was in the hospital. She had no white blood cells, which means she was at risk of infection. She had no platelets, which means she was at risk of bleeding. And, and I was taking care of her. I was her doctor. And every day I remember going into her room. She was there isolated because she was at risk of infection. She got platelet transfusions every day. But at a point, they, they stop working because you build up antibodies, so you can't get them. And so she's at risk of bleeding. And she's at risk of infection. And her daughter can't come to visit because her daughter could bring her an infection that could kill her. And every day on rounds, we, I would, my job to present her. So I would look at the data, and I would say, yeah, a, a normal platelet count is about 300,000. Just, just, so her plate hands were four. Oh my god. So she could just spontaneously bleed and die. And so I would report this. And I remember my attending physician saying, well, what day is it today? I said, it's the fifth. I had no idea. He said, well, Friday is the 10th. So I think on Friday, her plate count will be 10. And even then, I knew, OK, that is wishful thinking. That is not, that's, I, I've been here every day. It's been four every day. And I give her platelets every day. And it was really. It was so uncomfortable to take care of her and to not talk about it. And nobody talked to her. And it was just day after day, yeah, your platelets are four. We're still waiting. And it was like the emperor had no clothes. You know, the only person who could tell was the intern that she wasn't going to get better. And she died in the hospital. I thought, this is a horror show. Jeez. And she never saw her daughter, right? She spent a month in the hospital. And maybe that's what she wanted. but. I bet that's probably not what she wanted. And nobody knew how to talk about it. And I thought, <coughs> this and that. And I, after that, I thought, I am never going to do this kind of work, because mm. this is terrible. How can you do really? this work? Yeah, oh. I thought, I do not want to take care of dying people, for sure. I never want to be an oncologist. <laughs> that just seems like a horror show. <laughs> But then as I, you know, as I joined the faculty, and I realized this is really meaningful work if you don't avoid it. Right? There's tremendous opportunity if you actually turn towards it. And if you talk about what's going on, and if you actually offer alternatives to people, there's tremendous meaning. And, there's, it, and it's not a failure. You know, her leuke we didn't give her leukemia. But, mm -hmm. but in many ways, we added to her suffering right. rather than relieving her suffering. And, and when I joined the faculty, I thought, oh, this is. We can do really good work in these situations. Well, hold that thought. Um, I'm, I want to come back to that idea. Um, but next question, there's been, I don't know who watched the um, testimony today. Uh, and the word hope came up. <laughs> and uh, 
these various <laughs> interpretations of <laughs> what that might have meant. And in your context, which is you have an entire chapter on hope, do, right? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about what it means in this context and what you say. Yeah, it was so interesting. We were just talking about that, Katie, that on my way over, I, I, I heard it on the radio. They were dissecting what President Trump means when he said, I hope you will drop the end, whatever he said. And I thought, oh, hope is really, is really interesting in the context of serious illness. And there is this sense that we have that if we really talk about how sick you are and what's really going on, like with this 22-year-old woman, if we actually said to her how sick she was and what was going to happen, that she would just lose hope. And so we can't possibly talk about what's real because she would lose hope and that would be terrible. But what we find is that hope is really an essential part of the human experience. And we have hope. Uh, even when things look terrible, we still have hope. It's just that hope changes. So there's hope for cure, but there's a lot of hope that coexists. And it's only by talking about hope that we can really understand it and encourage it and, make, and, and actually help to make it happen. So a story around that is a woman who was in our ICU here at UCSF. She was in her 70s and she had really advanced what's called interstitial lung disease. So it's a scarring of the lungs that we can't make better. She got very short of breath. It just progresses and pretty rapidly. And she got very sick. She ended up in our ICU on, on very large uh, amount of oxygen, so high that you can't actually get that outside of the ICU. So she, she was basically living in our ICU. Oh. And so I said one day on rounds, I said, you know, we, we should ask her what she hopes for. Because this is one of my standard questions. When you look to the future, what do you hope will happen? I remember the team said, oh, I mean, look at her. You can't ask that question. I said, well, I think we need to. So we asked her, and she said, well, I really hope to see my daughter get married. I said, well, that's really important. Tell, tell us about that. She said, well, she's getting married in Napa in 10 months. I thought, I, I just don't see it. I don't, I don't see you how she. You thought that? Or? I thought so. This is what goes through my mind. There's no way. That's what goes through my mind right away. Mm -hmm. There's no way. I don't say that, but that's what goes through my mind. I, think, I don't think she's going to be alive in 10 months, and I don't think she's ever going to leave our ICU. So we talked about it as a team, and then we decided we would talk with her and her daughter. And her daughter said, well, that's really important. I want my mom at my wedding. How about if I just get married right here? In the ICU? In the ICU. And a week later, she shows up in this beautiful white wedding gown, wow. and her fiance's in a tuxedo, and they put a corsage on the, on the patient's hospital gown. And they had the bridesmaids. I mean, there were you know, all these people crowding around this ICU bed. There was this wedding with all the doctors and nurses, hovering, not a dry eye in the ICU. Oh and it was God. beautiful. I mean, it was not a wedding in Napa by far. It was not that. I mean, whatever they imagined, it was not that. But it was really beautiful. And it allowed her to achieve the things she hoped for. And what, what I realized is that it would have been easy to say, I hope so too. And she would think, I brought it up. The doctor said he hoped so too. I planned that wedding and nap in 10 months. And then she would get too sick, and she would die, and it would never happen. But by being willing to talk about it and to really say, here's, here's what's real. This is what reality is, and how can we help you achieve that hope it allowed something to happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Well, that reminds me, you have some, this book, by the way, is just so wonderful. And um, he, Steve has some uh, wonderful uh, kind of insights uh, and observations about patients speaking of the hope thing. Like, if you, as the physician, say, well, we're going to put you on three months on the chemo and then a break, and then, three, and then the patient makes a calculation Oh, well, that, mean, that must mean the doctor thinks that I have like at least seven months, right? right? That's right. And so have you changed the way you, you, know, you talk about that with patients? Yeah, absolutely. So you're, what you say is exactly right. The doctor says chemotherapy, then um, that's three weeks, and then you take a month off, and then we do three more weeks, and a month off, and three more weeks, and somebody's just calculating all the days like, OK, well, I got at least that long. But what you don't hear is if you get through all of that, right? So there's this if kind of behind it. Um, yeah, I, I've completely changed how I talk about it. I'm very, I try to be very conscious of when I talk about time and when people ask questions to recognize when they're actually asking about prognosis. 
So my patient, he was in the hospital, he had heart failure, he came out, we were talking in the office, and he told me about a cruise he was gonna take, just like the woman in the ICU, I'm taking a cruise in December, it was June, in December, I'm taking my whole family on a cruise. I'm like, oh, that's great, that's really lovely. And then it occurred to me, wait a minute, we're having a prognosis conversation, right. but I didn't realize it. Right. And I said, are you, are you asking whether I think that's okay? So you asked him that. I did, and he said, well, yeah, I said, I think, I think that's a good plan. Mm -hmm. But I had another patient who said, you know, I wanna go visit my hometown, and he had newly diagnosed pancreatic cancer, and we talked about that and said, you know what, you should go do that before you get the chemo. So does palliative care draw from other cultures, who, other cultures that are more comfortable with end-of-life discussions? I have not come across a culture that is is facile with end of life. I've just not, it may exist, <laughs> they just haven't come here yet. Mm -hmm. um, most people are pretty uncomfortable. Um, most people don't engage in it sort of spontaneously uh, and, and there's a lot of taboo, mostly what you see are taboos about talking about this topic and about illness rather than embracing it. So, which gets me to my next question, which is, ha have you seen since palliative care? And by the way, palliative care is a very popular specialty. In fact, one thing that seems paradoxical, I did a story um, a couple of years ago about the shortage of geriatricians in our country. Mm -hmm. And although very few people want to go into geriatrics, palliative care is incredibly popular. It so, is. have you seen kind of an, an embrace of, or a move towards, uh, what you said was, we're turning more towards it. And that's such an interesting sort of notion. It seems to be like we're making, are we making baby steps toward a much more, I don't know how to put it, um, sort of more acceptance, I guess. There's definitely, if you just look around, you notice that there is much more conversation about these issues than there ever was before. You know, when we start, so we started our palliative care service here in 1999, so you asked how things have changed. So we started in 1999, and we decided to sort of hang our shingle and waited for people to show up. We had 100 people come in the first year. Uh, which we thought was great, but um, so there's this, uh, there's this phenomenon in hospitals where someone has to carry the code pager. So what does that mean when there's a code blue, so somebody dies suddenly, there's a, there's a series of pagers that go off to alert a team of doctors, nurses, pharmacists to run to the patient's room to try and revive them. So someone always has to carry the code pager is a thing. Um, and if you don't wanna be resuscitated, they say that you're no code. So when I used to carry the palliative care pager back in 1999, people would say, oh, so you're carrying the no-code pager. Really? Yeah, really. <laughs> and then we had these two comfort care rooms, which were really lovely rooms that we redesigned to look more like home. I mean, they don't look like anybody's home, but more like home. Uh, and you know, people say, oh, is that patient in the room at the end of the hall? <laughs> and we had patients say, oh, I don't want to go in that room because people die in that room. And I thought, oh. Just as a clue, people die in every room in this <laughs> building, but okay. Um, so yeah, there was a lot, there were a lot of biases against it. You know, mm -hmm. it, was, it was not embraced right away. We, we had people say, well, this is great. This is really a great thing. There's a lot of people who need this. So how about in the ICU, you know, people who are on the ventilator, who are on a machine for 10 days, 10 days on a ventilator in the ICU, they should get a palliative care consult. That's a good idea. So we talked with all the ICU team, you know, the ICU teams, and they said, yeah, that's a, that is a good idea. We did that, and I remember calling a surgeon here in our hospital, and I said, hey, Steve Panelag calling from palliative care, and we have this program, people are on the ventilator for 10 days, you know, so I'm just looking at the chart, and I just wanted to chat with you, and he said, what are you doing looking at my patient? I didn't say you could look at my patient. Really? You absolutely <clears throat> cannot look, do not talk to my patient. I said, no, I have not seen your patient. I, I won't go see your patient. He then, he then did that thing that people do when they're mad, where you write that email that you're not supposed to send. <laughs> you mean you're supposed to like take a deep breath and read it? <laughs> Put it in your you drafts yeah. for like two days and then reread it and see if you still think that's what you want to send. But he then took it and sent it to Ooh. like everyone. Oh, wow. Literally and what did everyone. It, what did it say? It said, 
what do you, th I'm going to quote the juiciest phrase, which is, what do you think the public would say if they knew there was a program of planned euthanasia at UCSF? <laughs> that, was the, that was the best line. And I saw that, and I, my heart sank, and I thought, oh my goodness, what have we done? And, uh, and it, literally, he sent it to like, the chancellor, and you know, everyone prominent. We were like two years old, and I thought, this is going to end our program. And God bless the chief medical officer at the time, who was a surgeon, very prominent surgeon. And he had been on vacation, but he came back like three days later, and he fired off an email that said, basically, cool your jets. Palliative care is the best thing we have done for patients in this hospital in a, in a long time, if not ever. Mm -hmm. And that really, it, that program <laughs> ended. But, but it turned out to be one of these great opportunities for palliative care to sort of be endorsed. Um, so. so you have um, some myths that, there are three myths, in fact, that you like to debunk, yeah. I hear. Um, so, uh, and there are myths about serious illness that make it harder to get yeah. good care. So let's talk about that. So the one is that we, we already talked about, which was hope, that somehow talking about hope will take away, re uh, talking about reality will take away hope. And that's just not, that's not been my experience at all. In fact, it really creates a particular kind of reality that is in fact based in reality. Mm -hmm. So I will often tell my patients, you know, we've got this, we've, we've been dealt this hand, and we've got to play the hand we're dealt. We could wish we had a better hand, but this is what we've got. We've got to play this hand, so let's think about what our best play is. If you bet like you have a, a royal flush and you've got a pair of fives, that's not, that's not realistic. So let's think about what is realistic here, and let's play that hand. So I think that's the first one that is, is very important. And so talking. And, and we spend a lot of time trying to teach doctors and nurses how to have these conversations because they are not easy. These are not, I'm not pretending this is easy stuff, but it's really important. So that's the first one. Um, the, second, um, the second myth is that the goal in all of this is to have a good death. And, and if you look at our culture now, there is this conversation going on about a good death. And there's, you can go to the death cafe and Talk about the kind of death the, you want. The death cafes? Death cafes, we're, yeah. No, has there people heard of death cafes? Yeah. Has anyone been to one? <laughs> no? Yeah. So death cafes, you get together. You know, it's a group of people who get together over dinner or over in a cafe and talk about death and kind of what they imagine will happen. And, and I do this in some of my lectures. I, I ask people to imagine their death, you know, to really contrast it with what, <laughs> what really happened. But um, first of all, there is no good death. The d death is sad, and it's filled with grief and loss. And I have, I have been at the bedside of a lot of people who've died, and I have taken care of a lot of people who have died. And I've, I've yet to see one that was really good. Not to say that they can't be peaceful and comfortable and dignified, and we should do everything we can to make it that way. That is better than chaotic and painful. But it's still not good. And, and this idea that somehow our goal should be to, to help people achieve a good death um, flies in the face of the reality that death is really sad. And, and people grieve. You know, I remember taking care of a woman who was 102 years old. Two weeks prior, she bought a brand new car <laughs> as she was driving. <laughs> what kind of car? I don't remember. <laughs> But it doesn't matter. Any car. 102 years old. And she was having lunch with her family, and she just collapsed. And it turns out she had this massive bleed in her brain. And they brought her to the emergency room because they didn't know what was going on. And they, we found this out, and there she was in her ICU. And she was on mechanical ventilation, which is totally appropriate because they didn't know. I mean, you know, this is a 102-year-old driving. So we talked with the family, and they said, look, she's 102. She has had an incredible life, really full, really wonderful. I, you know, we know she's not going to live to be 200. And we get it. You know, she doesn't want to be on these machines. So, and we arrange for that. And I thought, look, if, if there's going to be a good death, like here it is, 102, you're still driving, right? And it's boom, right? Just boom. 
And there was so much sadness in the room and oh. so much grief and loss. Uh, and it wasn't diminished by the fact that she'd had a long, wonderful life. And it was no less, maybe it had a little less tragedy, but it's still tragic. And so that's my first problem with, with talking about that as a concept, as a good death. Um, and and I, don't, I don't have a problem with people talking about death and what they imagine it might be like and thinking about that, because that, those conversations can be very useful. But they're useful in how they help you think about life and how you want to live your life. And the reason I don't think about a good death is because I see my job is to help people have a good life and to have a good life with serious illness. And that's really what we should do. And thinking about how you want to die, which beach in Hawaii, and the music, and all that, does not help you live one day with serious illness. And it doesn't tell you whether you should have chemotherapy, or whether you should enroll in a clinical trial, or whether you should have surgery for your aortic valve. It doesn't do anything to help you make those decisions, to think about what I want when I die. And the, the, the challenge that we face with serious illness is how do we live the day to day with choices about treatments and, and the things we hope for and what is still possible and how do we make, how do we balance all those things? And that's really hard. And there's nothing about the contemplation of death that gets you through that part and caregiving and all those issues that we have to think about. And so what we focus on in, on the palliative care team is really helping people think about how do I live well with serious illness. And that's why, you know, this is not, this title life. is not an accident. It's yeah. about life after the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, one thing I do for the Times, I write um, obituaries and, uh, mm. <laughs> and I just exactly what you said. I mean, these obituaries, they're all about life. You know, there's like maybe um, I don't know, there's a new documentary out about yeah. Time's Obits, and um, one of the people interviewed, one of the writers says, you know, there's these many words about death, and the rest is all about life. Mm -hmm. And that's just so when I call the family, you know, they don't talk about the death. They talk about this amazing life, amazing rich life that this person led, and then because people are are living so much longer. I recently wrote one um, about uh, the guy who got trans fats out of our diets, and um, he lived to 102 on butter and eggs. Well, not on butter and eggs. And, um, and uh, we have to put in the cause of death. And I, uh, I asked the family, and they said, old age. They just insisted, old age. And I'm like, you know, that's good enough for me. Let me see if it'll fly. Past my editor, he said, "That's he said at 102, right? Do you agree, Dr. Panelist? I do. It's funny. We used to say people died of old age, and then there was this time where we said, no, people die of things. You know, they have to die of something. And now we're actually going back to some people do die of old age. Yeah. Okay, so that's two myths. Yep. We've got hope and good death. What yeah. was the third? The third is that we have to make this trade-off between quantity and quality of life. And we present it to people that way. That you know, what do you want? You know, you have to make a choice here. Do you want quantity or quality? And by that, what they're saying is, if you want quantity of life, you got to pick all the treatments that we have available, and you just got to keep taking them. So keep taking that chemotherapy. Keep taking the surgery that we offer, because that's how you get quantity. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's going to make you a little uncomfortable, so you're going to have to trade off a little bit of quality, but you get quantity. And if you really want quality, you're probably going to have to trade away a little bit of quantity. You, mm -hmm. you just won't live as long. And, there's, and there is this myth that I want to live long, so I'm going to take all the chemotherapy. But what the research is showing us is exactly the opposite. Being? That you can, first of all, that more treatment does not buy you more quantity, and it may not buy you even more quality, and that if you, accept pal if you get palliative care, you can get both quantity and quality. So let me just, so there's a lot in that. Let me just give you two two studies that, that really make this point. So one study interviewed people with advanced cancer, so metastatic cancer that was not curable. And they, had a, they, um, and they followed them along. And they asked them about their quality of life at the beginning of the study. And then they followed them forward until they died. And they looked to see what happened in the last six months of life. Most of these people were in their last six months of life. 
And they divided the group into three. One had a high, good quality of life, as they judged it. One had a moderate quality of life. And one group had poor quality of life, as they judged it. So they analyzed those separately. As who, who was doing the judging? The, the patient. The patient. They asked the patient, how's your quality of life? Some people said, great. Some people said, nah, it's OK. And some people said, you know, not that great. And then they looked to see whether the patient had received chemotherapy. And then they had their quality of life near the end of life. And they wanted to see, if you take chemotherapy, one, do you live longer? And two, what does it do to your quality of life? Yeah. And what they found is that whether, whether or not you took chemotherapy in the last six months of life made no difference in how long you live. Mm. So this is traditional chemotherapy made no difference. So you had a lot more side effects, but you didn't live any longer for it. And when they did the analysis about quality of life, they found people had a good quality of life at the beginning. Their quality of life actually went down mm. if they took chemotherapy. The people whose quality of life was not so good and terrible didn't get any worse. So in that setting, in the last six months of life, traditional chemotherapy didn't, give you, didn't help you live longer. And if you had a good quality of life, it actually ruined it. A lot of people take the chemotherapy because they think they're going to live longer. Now, one caveat here, there are new treatments. There's immunotherapy that is new type of treatment with a different side effect profile that can have a profound impact on people's quality of life and how long they live. And so that study was done before these treatments, and it's always worth asking about that. The other study was a study that was done of people with lung cancer. So these are people who presented with new lung cancer that had spread. So it was not curable lung cancer, who on average were going to live nine months. That's the prognosis if you get newly diagnosed, what we call metastatic lung cancer. It's nine months with chemotherapy. So a study done at Harvard. And what they did, everybody got chemotherapy, got standard cancer care at Harvard, which apparently is pretty good. I like to say it's not UCSF. <laughs> but apparently, it's pretty good. And then half, so this was a study, half the people were randomly assigned to get palliative care, along with all the other cancer care. And what they found is that the people who were randomly assigned to get palliative care in addition, they had less pain, mm. they had less shortness of breath, they had a better quality of life. They had less depression. And they lived longer by three months. Wow. So they lived longer. And part of the theory about why they lived longer is because they got less chemotherapy. So they were, spent less time in the hospital and had fewer complications. That's amazing. It's amazing. The other thing that's amazing, since we're talking about amazing, there was less depression. I told you that. There was less depression. But the people who got palliative care, they were no more likely to get antidepressants. So it's not that the palliative care team is better at figuring out who needs an antidepressant or managing that. But there was something really important about the relationship between the doctors and nurses and the patient and about really focusing on what's important to someone and finding meaning that really changed their experience and feeling supported. And that was a lot of what the palliative care team did, particularly early on. Um, so has what palliative care physicians do, has it trickled down to you know, physicians who are not palliative care? Have, have they learned to sort of talk differently or um, guide, help patients decide you know, in ways that they wouldn't have thought you know, before the whole palliative care yes. movement? There's definitely been a culture change in medicine. So if you look at medical students graduating today, our interns and residents, nursing students, um, their curriculum now includes palliative care. They have experiences in palliative care. People talk about it. You know, it was about five years ago, I was, we had a medical student on service, on the palliative care service. We were having lunch together. I said, so Dr. Powell, when did they start the palliative care service here? I said, well, you know, it was back in 1999, you know, when you were in elementary school, <laughs> basically. Uh, he said, wow. He said, thought about it. He goes, huh. So what did they do before palliative care? I thought, what a great yeah. comment, right? It's just, it seems to him so normal. It was like when I was a medical student and I had attending physicians who learned medicine before antibiotics, mm. right? And I'm like, how did you practice wow. medicine without antibiotics? It's like, how, so, how did you do that? It's so affirming. It to, is. Yeah. It really is. And I thought, oh, we've, we've, We've achieved something important in changing the way people imagine and, and experience uh, medicine and the culture and care. And, uh, and it does filter down. 
Um, so certainly people coming through uh, training now have a very different experience mm -hmm. and it's become a very normal thing, but in part because there is a palliative care service and because people do talk about it and they learn about it. Um, so I'm very hopeful because of that. Well, so what made you feel the need to write a book? The idea really came to me in talking to a, a good friend of mine, Joanne, who, who said, you know, who, who's, whose mom had breast cancer and was getting good care, but got to a point where she was having trouble figuring out what to, like, what to do. This is what I talked about before. How do you decide? Should I enroll in a clinical trial? Should I keep taking chemotherapy? I don't really think it's helping that much. What should I do? And Joanne said, look, you know, could you just talk to my dad? Just, just talk to him and help him. And I said, Joanne, how am I going to help your, first of all, I'm talking to your dad. Your, mom's, your mom is the one who's sick. I'm going to talk to your dad. And I'm not her doctor. And I'm not his doctor. So I don't actually think this is going to be very helpful. But Joanne's very persuasive. So she said, Look, just call my dad. So I did. And we talked for maybe an hour. And then about 20 minutes later, Joanne called and goes, oh my god, that was so helpful. Thank you so much. My dad said, it's like so helpful. And I thought, really, all I did was talk to him like I would anybody else. And I just shared kind of how I think about things. And it didn't, honestly, it didn't seem that amazing from my perspective. But it gave me this insight that there is knowledge that I have, that we have on our team, that is really valuable and that you cannot Google your way through. Like, you can't just Google, like, should I take this treatment for, right? How would you know? I can second that. For instance, the, um, the whole shortness of breath discussion about how it's harder on patients to be short of breath than to be in pain. That was yeah. completely news to me. Yeah. I mean, when you're short of breath, you think you're going to die. That's how it feels. You feel like you're going to suffocate. People are so frightened, appropriately so, because you actually can die of shortness of breath. Um, but people don't die of pain. So while it's terrible, it's different. Mm -hmm. Or this just came up with a, a, a colleague of mine who had, <laughs> who, whose mom had died. And she read the book, and she said, Oh my God, in the book, you write how at the end of life, you know, when people, often when people are dying and they have pain or other symptoms, you have to give them pain medicine pretty frequently, like sometimes every hour. And they die. So they're always going to die, on average, about a half an hour after their last dose. But it could be five minutes after their last dose. Mm. And people think that they killed their, their loved one because they gave the dose of morphine and then they died. Mm -hmm. And it looks like I gave the drug and they died. Mm -hmm. But this happens all the time. And if you give it every hour, that's going to happen. On average, about a half hour after, actually. And so I write, like, people, it's people are dying and they get the medicine, but those things are not related. And they have to get the medicine to be comfortable. And she said, I, I felt so guilty. I thought I had killed my mom. Oh. And then I called my brother right away and I said, we didn't kill our mom. <laughs> uh, so the, yes, there are things that people don't know. Uh, and so that was part of it. And you cannot Google it. You know? and, I have, and, and, and then after that, I, got, I routinely get emails and calls from friends and colleagues and even family members saying, my mom has you know, my dad, my mom, my grandmother. And there's a lot that Real, even super smart people don't know. And I thought, you know what? And, and then Joanne, so it is Joanne who said, that was so helpful. What book should my dad read? I mm. said, there is no book. Bingo. And then she said, mm -hmm. well, then you should write it. I went, ha ha. That's funny. <laughs> there are some great narratives out there, like um, the Katie Butler book, Knocking on Heaven's Door is yeah. a great book, and several others. Um, yes. And of course, there's the Gawande. But this is. I have to reiterate this, so helpful and informative, but I could only read it in little doses. It was so <laughs> depressing and scary. And scary. And there I are thought, hopeful parts. Which is, yeah, um, yeah. And at the same time, so um, important yeah. to nice. read. And, um, but you must, do you go home every night and like tell your wife you love her and your children and it, my son is here. Not every night. <laughs> He's in college now. But yes, uh, yes. I mean, to, uh, people, people, you know, you talk to people about what you do, and they're like, oh my god, that must be so depressing. And actually, it's not depressing at all. Uh -huh. I, I find my work very um, 
believe it or not, uplifting. Not to say that it's not sad. I mean, there are sad cases. I, I was on service a few weeks ago, and it was Monday morning, so I'm hearing about all the new cases. And you know, so we're going through, you know, patient, you know, this patient, that patient, talking about their care, and then the social worker says, "Oh, it's a really sad case." <laughs> and I thought, when you're a sad case on the palliative care team, <laughs> that's really saying something. And you just lose, you know, you just lose perspective because every case is tragic. Like every yeah. case we talk about is sad. You don't get on our team unless it's sad. Yeah. They're all sad. But when the when the social worker says sad case, you're like oh yeah, and it was. I mean, it was really heartbreaking. Uh, so, but it does give you perspective on what's important. Absolutely. And I remember the page, I was talking to a patient with pancreatic cancer about this, and I, and I said, you know, if something were to happen suddenly and you were to die, would you want to be resuscitated? And he said, well, if I'm dying of my cancer, no. But I'm not dying of my cancer today. So I think wow. yes. Like, you know, Dr. Pound, it's like this. If, if I were walking across the street in front of the mm -hmm. hospital and there was a bus coming by and I was about to get hit by a bus, I hope you'd push me out of the way and you wouldn't go, oh, there's a guy with pancreatic cancer, what the heck, right? And I thought, that's really interesting. And then he looked at me and said, you know, I mean, that can happen to you. I thought, well, thanks for that. Uh, but, it real, but I thought, you're, you're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, nobody, no, none of us is promised tomorrow. And I see yeah. people every day who one day woke up to just life changing news. And you know, I, I, I describe it like you're on the plane, and there you are. You're flying at 36,000 feet, and you're watching your movie, and you've got a drink, and things are great. And suddenly, the plane drops 10,000 feet, and there's an engine on fire. Thanks, Steve. And you think you're going to crash to the ground. But the point is, you're not. I mean, it's bad. It's bad news. Um, and you think you're going to die right then, but you're not. And there can be, and I guess the point is, for, for, for people who are seriously ill, the point is that there can still be a lot of joy and there can still be a lot of good life that people can live and there's a lot that we can do. And there can be a lot of happiness, there can be a lot of laughter, there can, you can still achieve a lot of the things that you want to do. Yeah, the plane's going to a different place and the flight is not going to be quite as long as you hoped, but you can still get there. And, and for, I think for all of us, it really tells us, you know, Life is limited. I mean, not that we didn't know that, but it's hard to be aware of it. And, and this, I do go home and I think, this, is, this was a good day. Like, I am grateful for today and I want to be grateful for tomorrow. And, and am I doing the things I most want to do? Mm. Because, I, you know, I'm hoping to live long, but I don't, there's no guarantee. So that reminds me of the Go Wish cards. I was having dinner with a palliative care physician, not you. Um, recently, and she said, oh, you don't know about the Go Wish cards, so tell us about the... Well, Go Wish cards are very interesting. They, they have a whole bunch of, uh, you, you know, ideas or sort of um, possibilities on them. And the idea is that you would take this and you would play with your family, uh, and there are different options on here, like uh, what's important to you uh, as you're sick, so to have my family with me, um, to be able to talk about what death means, to meet with clergy or chaplain, um, uh, what's important to you, not being connected to machines, uh, to be at peace with God. And then you get to, you basically get to prioritize these, put them in piles, and basically start sorting through what is most important. And it's a way of really um, identifying what are the most important things for you, um, and the things that you really hope will happen, and the things that you, that you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's just a way to engage. You know, Having said that we should talk about what we hope for and talk about serious illness, it's just not that easy. And it is kind of a downer. Like, you know, it's not, you know, like Thanksgiving. Hey, everybody, welcome. Let's get out the go I with just, cards. I just read this great book and I want to talk to you about serious illness. It's not, it is not the uplifting topic and yet it's really important. What I talk about in here is the chapter on talking to your family I call the gift. Because it really is a gift that we give to our loved ones to tell them what is important to us so that they don't have to guess. Because otherwise, what's going to happen is they're going to guess. They're going to be left to decide for you. And this happened just two weeks ago when I was, in the, I was on service and taking care of a really super sick guy, sick in about every way you can be sick. And 
they called us because you know his his family's not getting it. And, you know, it turned out they got it fine. They really knew how sick he was. They and what the wife said is, "There's no way that I'm going to be able to tell you to stop the machines and let my husband die." And that's it. And a lot of people feel that way. Mm. And so the gift of talking to your family is about not asking them to make that decision, mm -hmm. but telling them. If, it, if it's like this, mm -hmm. then I don't, I don't want it. I don't want those interventions anymore if my life is like this. And then it's just, and then it's an act of love back to your loved one to say, I'm doing what he wants me to do. And then you got to pick the person who can do that. Having said that, not everyone can do that. So, I, you know, I, I, I just saw a patient in my office uh, who, who with um, fairly advanced Parkinson's disease, and we were talking about her preferences, and she said, yeah, it's got to be my son. Because my husband, no way he can make this mm. decision, even when I tell him. And my daughter won't be able to do it either. Mm -hmm. And it has to be my son. So, well, that is really important. And we need to talk all together about this. Because what happens then is it just creates a lot of strife. And so we're going to have to all talk about it, but that's really important. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that, talking with them in advance is really, really important. And this, you know, this is a, a way of doing that. There's something called the Conversation Project that was started by Ellen Goodman, who's the Pulitzer Prize winning mm -hmm. um, columnist for the Boston Globe. Started something called the Conversation Project. You can actually download, go to their website, you can download the Conversation pro Project, um, Conversation Starter Guide. Um, Rebecca Sudori, who's one of the faculty here at UCSF, developed something called Prepare for Your Care. I reference it in my book. Uh, it's a website that helps you think about your preferences and gives you language for how to talk with your family and ask them if they would be your decision maker if you can't decide. So there are tools out there to help, mm -hmm. help you do that. So let's open it to questions. So we, uh, so Laguna Honda is a public nursing home. So the question is, what about Laguna Honda? And uh, that, that it's an entire facility that sort of operates with palliative care principles, which I, I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but I think you're exactly right. They also have a palliative care unit at Laguna Honda, a separate unit um, for palliative care as well. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a palli uh, Laguna Honda is a very special place. I mean, and we, so our, our relationship with Laguna Honda is that we send a lot of patients there because they, you know, there, there are lots of people who don't need to be in the hospital to get good care as they are, when they are sick and as they're approaching the end of life. Um, and yet, home is not an option for any number of reasons. They don't have a home, um, they don't have anyone who can care for them, uh, or they have people who could but, but can't, and that's, that happens. And so they end up there, and it, they, they really do get wonderful mm -hmm. care there, and they're very aware of that. And um, the story I tell is, uh, so in the old Laguna Honda, they had a hospice unit on the first floor, because um, it was by the garden, which was really lovely, and they had a smoking room. But it wasn't where you isolate smokers and make them feel bad in a cloud of smoke. It was, they had pictures of Humphrey Bogart and <laughs> Betty Davis great? smoking. So that. they were like, I, I would say it's like cool people smoke, back when smoking was cool. And you know, and I, I, I really appreciated it because the idea was, look, if you're dying because you have a smoking-related illness, you know, you don't have to be told. And frankly, now's not, you can quit, it's better for you, it's still better for you to quit, but if you can, we're not gonna make you feel guilty every day. We're just gonna respect that fact. Um, and then today, it's funny, I was talking to someone just today about Laguna Honda um, with one of our fellows and, uh, so they, they had, every Friday, they would have like a little party. And they would serve alcohol. And so people would say, well, do you give alcohol to people with cirrhosis? <laughs> and you can imagine the answer, right? And like, of course we do. <laughs> if they want, here they are. They're on the hospice unit. They want alcohol. They can have alcohol. <laughs> so it was just this, it was very um, respectful of people. Mm. And I think it was a really, it was a great model. And I learned a lot, actually, early in my career from them. Thanks for bringing that mm. up. When we're um, providing palliative care, what percentage of the time is with the patient and what percentage of the time is with the family? Uh, so that varies a lot um, depending on uh, what the patient's, how, how capable the patient is of kind of interacting and, and how, much, how much family there is and how much they want to interact. So it does vary a lot, but 
you know, the way we think about providing care is to the patient and family. And family the way the patient defines it. So there are lots of, you know, families take many different forms, uh, but we really think about caring for patients and families in palliative care and recognizing that um, there are times when most of the care we're providing is to the family. The patient is unresponsive, maybe they're actively dying, they're actually pretty comfortable, and we're really trying to help families anticipate. And just to your point that you said before, Katie, just the things you don't know. Like mm -hmm. what don't, like the, all the things you don't know that, you know, she's not eating. She's not eating, she's gonna die if she doesn't eat. It's like, no, actually it's the exact opposite. People who are dying stop eating. Mm -hmm. But people get very worried about it because every other time in your life you need to eat to survive, but not then. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of, we don't have a lot of experience these days of being with people as they are dying. So we don't know what that looks like. But, but we do, so we can anticipate for you. Like, they're gonna, they're gonna breathe differently and they're gonna look different and their skin's gonna get purpley and cold. And these are the things that you may notice. The thing I always tell families is, something could happen suddenly, because it does. And so the family's at the bedside 23 hours a day and they go for coffee or lunch and that's when their loved one dies. And, they, and I, what I tell them is, that happens. So if you wanna be there, you have to be there all the time. And that happens so often that it's almost as though it happens on purpose. Like it's too hard to leave you, or they don't want to put you through it, and they're waiting for that moment when they're alone. That happened with my grandfather. So my mom and my aunt and uncle and my grandmother were in the room with him when he was at home with hospice, and they stepped out for a minute, and they came back and he had died. And what people say is, oh my goodness, I, I abandoned my dad when he died. And that's terrible. That thought is a terrible thought. But it's just as likely that he waited for you. I mean, I, I don't know how that happens. I, I can't explain it, but it happens. Uh, and I can't tell you how often someone will say, you know, that happened with my Uncle Joe, that happened with my grandmother, my grandfather. Uh, so anticipating those things for people can be very helpful and letting families know. And it actually has an impact on their grieving. So, so knowing what to expect actually makes your grief easier and Getting palliative care makes it less likely that you will be depressed or have complicated grief after your loved one dies. So the word palliative, I just thought of this, duh. Uh, the <laughs> word palliative, it's like, it's not just clearly for the patient, it's very much for the family. Absolutely, oh. absolutely. Yes. The question is, is there a difference between hospice and palliative care, or are they pretty much the same? Um, the way I, I think about it and the way I describe it is that all hospice is palliative care, but not all palliative care is hospice. And the way we sort of organized palliative care back in 1982 when it was passed uh, by Congress as a, as a benefit, the way we've organized hospice is a particular way that says you need to have a six-month prognosis, so the doctor has to verify a six-month prognosis, and that basically you say, I'm at a point where I don't, I'm not interested in taking these treatments to manage my my illness, so chemotherapy, surgery, whatever, I really want to focus on you know, just being comfortable. Mm -hmm. And back in 1982, that made a lot of sense, because frankly, we didn't have that many things we could do. Medicine has come an incredibly long way, thankfully, in those you know, 35 years. Uh, but that's, so that's hospice, so it's a very particular kind of benefit. Hospice is a way to get palliative care generally at home, it's available pretty much in every community in the United States. So that's hospice. But you can get palliative care at the time of diagnosis. You can get palliative care when you're starting to undergo a bone marrow transplant. There's just a study that was published by colleagues of mine, and again at Harvard, who did a study of people undergoing curative bone marrow transplant for leukemia who received palliative care. And it turned out that made their quality of life better. Mm. Or what it did, technically, is it made their quality of life worsen less. Because bone marrow transplants really ruin your quality of life for a while. Now they save your life, hopefully, but they ruin it. But it didn't, it, the quality of life didn't drop as, as far. So that's how I think about it. So yes, hospice is probably the most common way that people receive palliative care, but you can get it 
in the office. We offer it here at UCSF in the office, at home. You can get palliative care that's not hospice at home. We provide it through telehealth now for people who live far away. So many in any setting. So two questions. One was about death doulas, and one had to do with sort of uh, the combination of sort of death panels and also the issue of value in healthcare and how palliative care addresses that. Uh, yeah, I, I, death doulas are great. You know, people who are experienced uh, with what that process is like, and you know, people. As I said, it's not something we know that much or have a lot of experience about. So, how does it work, a death doula? So I, I don't know. I'll be honest. I don't know a lot about it, but um, it, it's it's a it's a kind of a riff on the idea of doulas around birth of someone who's very experienced uh, at birth, who's not, um, you know, not a doctor or nurse or nurse practitioner, but still or is a very or a midwife, right? But nonetheless, has a lot of experience and can sort of help you through that process. Not just the birthing process, my understanding, but even sort of in the immediate post, what we call postpartum after delivery. Um, period. And the idea was, well, if you can do that for birth, we should be able to do that for death. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, to that point about birth and death, when we, when we, uh, our, pa our palliative care rooms, our what we call comfort care suites, um, when we first opened them, uh, they were on the, uh, on the 14th floor of the hospital at the end of the hall with this beautiful view looking out at Berkeley, basically. And, um, right above them, literally the two rooms above them were the birthing suites at UCSF. Um, and they were designed to look more like home, although not like anyone's home you've ever been in. Uh, but the idea was that we could create an environment that was not medicalized if it didn't need to be, but could be if that was necessary, that it would be more home-like. Um, and we thought it was really fitting that the birthing suites and the comfort care suites for people who are dying were had the same sort of focus and intention and attention to detail. Um, so uh, so that's the, I, I think that's terrific if you need that help. I think you could get that help through hospice. I think there are other ways to get it, but I think that's really helpful. Um, the value proposition, yeah, you know, it's really important. I mean, here's a service that uh, increases quality. So it makes, qual so what's value? Value is determined as quality over cost. And that's true of anything. Food, cars, houses, you know, Good value is when you get a lot of quality for lower cost. Uh, and it's true in healthcare. And it just so happens that if you take people who are seriously ill and you offer them a realistic set of choices, often what they want that's most important to them are the things that are not high tech, high cost, high intervention. Right? Most people don't want to be in the ICU hooked up to a lot of machines. They want to be home with their family members. And so you can imagine the difference in cost right there. And if you can ask people and, and really get them the care they want, overall, people will choose the care people actually want turns out to cost less. That's not true for everybody every time, but on balance it is. And it allows us, frankly, to provide you know, more and better care to more people. So the, the question is whether patients are referred by their doctor or whether they come on their own. Um, so in the hospital, they come by referral from their doctor. So that's kind of mm. the, way, the way things work. Uh, there are many reasons for that, but it comes that way. Uh, um, outside the hospital, they, they can, you know, they can come just like you can go to any doctor. I mean, it depends on your insurance a little bit about whether you need a referral for special, because we're a specialty. So it depends a little bit on whether you need a referral from your doctor. But if you don't need that, you can just come. You can call us up. But we do. Obviously, we see ourselves as part of a team, and our job is not to take over care or to replace another doctor, but really to work with the doctors, nurses, social workers who are already taking care of the patient and, uh, you know, and collaborate with them. And um, so that's, that's kind of the, the ideal. How many physicians are there in the program? So uh, it depends how we define that. If you just look across UCSF and you look at, you know, at all our sites, how many palliative care doctors there are, there's a lot. And um, we're very blessed at UCSF. It's, it's probably be between 30 and 40. Wow. What I mean, palliative care certified doctors, mm -hmm. um, which is just really remarkable. Um, there's a shortage of palliative care doctors in the world. So we're very fortunate mm -hmm. at UCSF to 
to have a bunch. We train four specialists every year. We have four fellows. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow's their graduation. Mm -hmm. We train four a year. Today I learned that someone said, I think half the, half the resident class wants to do palliative care. <laughs> and it is one, just to your so point, Katie, it's one of the most popular specialties why? among the internal medicine residents, which just warms my heart to know, and I have to say. It is amazing, and why it's is amazing. that? It's amazing. I think that there's a way in which palliative care really gets to the heart of why people come to medicine, mm -hmm. which is kind of this human interaction um, and this meaningful um, way of interacting with patients and talking with them and really trying to understand what's important. I think a lot, many, many people come to the field of medicine, doctors, nurses, social workers, shamans, because they value that kind of human interaction. And <clears throat> there is so much of it, and, and that is so valued in the work that we do. And I think it, it, there's a group of people in our field for whom that idea really resonates. Like that's why they want it to be doctors. Because they wanted that's that's the thing that they really value. And it's it's not only about that, but it's a lot about that. Mm -hmm. How's the pay? <laughs> Kidding. Could be better. <laughs> no. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> yeah, it's so yeah, I've been working on a story where we are actually looking at pay uh, and uh, it is quite very much the case that the most gratifying specialties are not the highest paid, which is just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So the question is, is it only internists? And the answer is no. Actually, you can come to palliative medicine from 10 different specialties. So it's one of the subspecialties that has the most avenues, if you will. So internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, emergency medicine, OBGYN, psychiatry, neurology, surgery, anesthesia, physical medicine, and physical and, and rehab medicine. I think I might have gotten them all. That was pretty good. But um, that was 10 at any rate. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and we've had fellows. We have two emergency medicine fellows and two internal medicine fellows this year. We've had uh, emergency medicine, neurology, um, family medicine, OBGYN, hmm. residents well, who've come through in years. one year, one year clinical, yeah. And we have four positions here. So two questions, one about um, insurance and how insurance companies view palliative care, number one, and number two, um, the Death with Dignity Act. So um, the first one about insurance companies. Uh, they are increasingly embracing palliative care. It's really been remarkable to see. We actually have a project ongoing with Blue Shield of California um, to, pr to provide home-based palliative care, and they, Tori Fields, who works there, uh, is really leading that effort, and it's remarkable. Uh, and they want it available to every one of their you know, members. Um, Kaiser as a system has embraced palliative care. They're developing it outpatient um, as well as inpatient at every single facility. Um, HealthNet is doing the same thing. Uh, Cambia, which is uh, the, Blue Cross, the Blue Shield provider in the Pacific Northwest, has developed you know, best-in-class uh, um, uh, insurance benefit in palliative care. The, the challenge these days is finding palliative care, not really getting it paid for. It's much easier, ironically now, it's almost easier to get it paid for than it is to find. What I say in my book is just, go this is one thing you can Google, is Google where you live and palliative care and hope that you find something. Mm -hmm. But a lot of hospices are starting to provide palliative care. That's not hospice. A lot of palliative care teams like ours are providing palliative care in the office. And so um, they, they get it, and it, when you talk to the folks in the insurance company, they get it for all the right reasons. Because which they see, are? Which is that it's good care. You know, that they want to take good care of seriously old people. I think there is a business case for it, but it really is about, you know, look, we have members who are sick and they're being cared for, and if we don't provide some kind of care for them, they're just gonna land in the ER again. And that's about the worst place you can be when you're seriously ill and approaching the end of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just not the best place. But what happens when you call? Does, has anyone called their doctor's office? What do they say? If this is an emergency, hang up and call 911. Well, yeah, it's an emergency. 
I'm short of breath at two o'clock in the morning. What, you know, so what do you do? So, you know, if you have a palliative care team, if you have a hospice that you can call instead mm. and they can help you through that and maybe even come see you, there's a lot of options. So, so yes, yeah, so, so so, and they see us as specialists. So I think to the second part of your question, they see us as specialists. Even though there is a point where we might become primary, they do see us as specialists. And we, honestly, most of the time, we see ourselves as specialists. It's a very small sliver of people for whom palliative care becomes really their primary. Um, the Death with Dignity Act, um, Aid in Dying. Uh, so we just passed the one-year anniversary in California. Just happened. In fact, there was, an, there was a piece today on All Things Considered. One of our faculty, Liz Zhang, who's one of our faculty here at UCSF, was quoted in the article. She's really provided a lot of leadership <coughs> state, statewide in that. So if you want to hear a little bit about it, All Things Considered uh, on NPR. Uh, hasn't affected us that much. It comes up. It definitely comes up. People bring it up. I'd say when it first became legal a year ago, a lot more. Like people were waiting and wanted to talk about it. It does come up more. Our experience, my experience with it so far, is, is like the Oregon experience, where they've had a lot of experience, which is it's often an expression of concern about the future and what that future holds and worrying about something bad that might happen. And often what people worry about are things we can reassure them about. And so it comes up a lot more than people follow through with it. And I've not, at least here, um, have not heard of a patient who you know, completed it, which is to say went through the process to get the prescription, the medication, and then took it. But we do have a policy. And it is, UCSF is a, participates in that. And we do have physicians who, will, who, who do participate for patients who are interested. So the question is about how we who do palliative care kind of take care of ourselves, given all the sadness that we experience um, with, with patients and families. And then how might we translate that to the care of, of caregivers, families, and loved ones? Uh, we think a lot about that. Burnout is a big issue in our field, um, more so than high even for medicine. So mm -hmm. medicine, burnout in medicine is very high compared to other professions. So usually as your education level goes up, you're less likely to be burned out, unless you're in medicine. It's the exact opposite. Um, so burnout is very high. And primary care physicians have a very high. Very high. Mm -hmm. Frontline clinicians, uh, primary care physicians, hospitalists, emergency medicine physicians all have much higher uh, rates of burnout. So front, you know, people who kind of are there in with patients all the time. So we think about it a lot. We talk about it on rounds. We support each other. Yeah, our chaplain, Dina Joseph, is, is really just um, wonderful with this. Um, teaches our fellows an entire curriculum on resiliency and self-care, how you take care of yourself every day. What do you do every day, every week, every month, every year to take care of yourself? Um, we talk about many different practices, gratitude practice, mindfulness to do that. Um, often on rounds, we'll read poetry. Really? Yeah, I start, I start rounds. I often start rounds with poetry. Any particular um, poets? Or po uh, I read a lot of Mary Oliver. Oh, wow. I call Mary Oliver the, the uh, poet laureate of palliative care. I don't know if she knows that, but we <laughs> think of her that way. Oh. My colleague Steve McPhee really is um, my mentor, really taught me that. And, um, if you, those of us who are old enough to remember Palm Pilots, I don't, this, I'm dating myself by a lot, uh, but the Palm Pilot was the original little assistant. Um, Steve called his a poem pilot because it was filled with poems that he would, he would read them at the bedside. Oh I, I don't, that doesn't work for me, but we do read them on rounds in a way to sort of connect, you know, inside. And then what Dina always says, and that I really take from her, is connection is protection. So to protect from burnout, we have to be connected to hu other humans. Mm -hmm. And so every Friday, we have a lunch together where we, where we talk. We, um, we round together every day. We have FaceTime every day. We, we, we talk and share. And that's probably the most important thing that you can do. And we, and we emphasize it. And that, for families, is incredibly important. And really trying to think about you know, respite for caregivers. You know, most caregivers are 24-7 with no breaks, so you have to get breaks. And I, and I write in my book, you know, if you don't know what else to do, just give someone a break. 
just come over and say, I will sit here for three hours, it's gonna be fine, you can take a break. So, you know, living your life, continuing to have a life, making sure that you get breaks, that you sleep. Um, caregiving is really um, a tremendous gift uh, and really hard and um, generally cannot be done alone. So trying to get a team, getting, getting help, and trying to share some of those issues so that, you know, sharing. And, and so one of our, our chaplains, Judy Long, who works with our Parkinson's disease um, project in our clinic and also um, working in our cancer center now, um, does a lot of work with families and with caregivers around issues around mindfulness and other kinds of you know, guided imagery, things like that, things that you can do at home. There's, there's apps for this. There's the Calm app. There's the Mindspace app. If you're into a little bit of mindfulness, that can be really helpful. Interacting with other humans, not letting yourself get isolated. So, uh, so how do we incorporate mindfulness? At the bedside, really, just really with patients, and it can just be a few minutes of just focusing on the body, focusing. There's, um, Dina will do a mindfulness exercise of just feeling supported, just sitting in a chair or lying in a bed and mm -hmm. feeling the support that the seat gives you and that the floor gives you, and just feeling held. So there's many ways to, to guide people, and it's not teaching people how to meditate. It is not that. That is a lifelong practice, uh, but it is moments of focus, on your, on your experience and, and non-judgmental focus. And I'm not quite doing it justice, but there are ways to do it and, and there are good apps for doing it and that can be very helpful. But even something as simple as gratitude practice can be great. Every night before you go to bed, write down three things you're grateful for. There's a great poem called Three Gratitudes by Carrie Newcomer. If you want to read a great poem about gratitude, uh, Three Gratitudes by Carrie Newcomer. But that, that has been demonstrated actually in studies to um, increase resiliency, just writing three things you're grateful for. And if you stop, if you can stop at three, I challenge you to stop at three. Most people who start, they just, mm. just keep going. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what about people who either don't have a home or don't have a caregiver or you know, have family who can't provide the care or it's not a appropriate to what they need? What happens to those people? Like, what's between home and hospital, uh, in essence? Uh, there's a real gap uh, in, in our society, in our, in our country, in that. So uh, among uh, developed countries in the world, the United States is unique in spending more money on health care than on social services, including for people who are sick and approaching the end of life. So often, the lack of a caregiver who can be with you overnight means you end up in a nursing home. Mm. And that's a shame. I often say, you know, we could put you up in the Mark Hopkins Hotel with a 24-hour nurse for less than the price of an ICU. But there's no way to do that. Like, we can't actually make that happen in America, which is unfortunate. Uh, so what are the options? There are a few inpatient hospice units in San Francisco where as, as few beds as we have, we are blessed with more beds than most places. So there's Coming Home Hospice, which is in the Castro, which started as a, a hospice for it during the AIDS crisis. For young, you know, there were a lot of young men who didn't have their family here and were dying. Um, so there's Coming Home Hospice, there's the Zen, the Zen House, there's Laguna Honda. Those are three inpatient hospice units where people can go. The challenge is that um, it's the rare insurance that will pay for it. And I think mm -hmm. to the question about insurance, one thing that insurance companies could do to make care better is to pay for that, the kind of room and board part of care. But there are those places. A lot of people will honestly end up in skilled nursing or nursing homes. And some of them really do make an effort to provide nicer space in the way that we do, to create a nicer space, which is important. Um, but there is that, that's a problem. And some people, frankly, end up in hospitals because there's nowhere else um, for them to be, which is really unfortunate. But people end up in hospitals for lots of reasons uh, that are really unfortunate because we don't have the places that people need to be cared for. So if, what I'd like to do is ask you if there's something you'd like to read from the book. Yeah, um, thank you. To close. And while he's finding the spot, the book is available, Books Inc. I think uh, Tim mentioned it's, uh, it's being sold outside. And um, 
again, well worth, how much is it? <laughs> Whatever it costs. It's a steal. It's a, it's it's a good value. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Katie. Oh, this was really lovely. My goodness so thank gracious. You. It was really fun what to an honor. have a chance to chat. <clears throat> this is about my grandmother, my, my Safta. <clears throat> My Safta used to sign birthday cards with the wish that you should live to 120. Moses lived 120 years. A traditional birthday wish is that you should have a long life like Moses, the greatest teacher and leader of the Jewish people. But as she got older, my grandmother changed it just a bit. In Hebrew, she switched just one letter, and the change in meaning was profound. Rather than writing, live to 120, she wrote, Live to 100 like 20. Mm. Live long and live well. My Safta understood that a good life is even more important than a long life. She lived that saying and declined chemotherapy when she was diagnosed with lung cancer at age 93. Not all of us will live that long, but we can all live the essence of that saying by living well. The challenge we face is to live as well as possible with serious illness. I've learned that we can meet that, this challenge. Serious illness doesn't have to ruin your life or shut it down. Even in what feels like a tragedy, you can still have great joy along with the sadness. You can find great opportunities to achieve important goals, even if the time is short. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Katie.